Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, second edition of the, uh, the Hero Knowledge Translation Rounds. Um, so um, I'd like to start off first of all by thanking Brianna and Simran for doing all of the organization and all the technical support for this. Um, we really wouldn't be able to get these evenings together without the help of them and and uh, all of the other people that help support the uh, the administrative side of uh, the Hero uh, project. Um, so uh, the uh, for anyone who missed the first edition of this round, which was um, a year ago now, uh, I'll just start off by saying a few words about our goals. Um, so um, so the the Hero Network is continuing to facilitate research and in, to inherited heart diseases across a, a wide range of um, areas. Um, and uh, of course, we rely on on the uh, the kindness of our patients helping us uh, by enrolling in our studies and uh, the many wonderful um, investigators and um, collaborators in the network um, to continue to to build on uh, the uh, the projects that we uh, contribute to. And the goal of this evening's meeting is to communicate some of the results of this work um, that have been uh, released over the last year. And our goal is really to increase awareness of the studies and also help kind of synthesize their results with our existing understanding and hopefully uh, improve clinical practice. Um, so in this edition, we're going to talk about some of the new research um, published uh, from, from HERO in, in the last year. We're also going to hear about um, some research that isn't generated directly from HERO um, patients, um, but uh, has the potential to change our practice by uh, maybe expanding the range of patients that fall under the umbrella of inherited heart disease. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to hand over to my co-chair, Simon Hansen. Thanks, David. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping notices from my side. Uh, welcome, everybody. So over the next hour and a half or so, we're going to have three speakers lined up, and each speaker is going to present for around 15 minutes. And then we're going to have five to 10 minutes for a Q&A session after each presentation. Uh, we'd really like to encourage you to pose your questions through the chat uh, during um, those presentations, and then either myself or David will put those questions to the speakers. If you would like to raise your hand and personally um, put your question across, then please do so. And then again, David and I will field those uh, for you. Uh, we'll endeavour to get through all the questions. There may be uh, lots, but we will do our best within the time available. Uh, in regard to the second presentation, we're excited as always to have Yael al uh, present, but given the time difference between here and Saudi Arabia, it's around 3 a.m. I think. Uh, so he has very kindly pre-recorded his session for us and also uh, pre-recorded uh, some answers to some questions that we put in before. Uh, again, please actually submit your questions. And again, if you want to raise your hand, please do so at the end. Uh, and Andrew Cron has very kindly um, agreed to step in and answer any questions on behalf of YL. Uh, in keeping with the goals of HERO, um, patient participation and our patient partners are a vital part of all that we do. Um, we had hoped to have a patient partner join us this evening, but I think because of existing commitments, they may not be able to join us. We're going to keep a lookout. If they pop into their meeting later on, we'll seamlessly slide them in between um, uh, presentations, um, but otherwise we'll, we'll try again next time. Um, so we hope that you find these sessions uh, engaging, and again, we just hope that you'll uh, join in and uh, participate along the way. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So uh, Brandon Chalazan is a medical geneticist and biochemical geneticist at the Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. He completed his residency in medical genetics and a fellowship in bio, uh, biochemical genetics at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. He completed his PhD and postdoctoral fellowship in cardiovascular genetics with Dr. Dawood Darba, and his clinical interests are focused on innovative therapies for rare diseases and inherited cardiovascular disease in fetuses, children, and adults. His research interest is focused on the monogenic aspects of atrial fibrillation and better understanding these underlying mechanisms at a translational level. So with that, uh, Brandon, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks so much for that kind introduction, uh, Simon. And uh, thanks uh, also to the HERO team for extending the invite to uh, talk uh, at this uh, wonderful virtual conference. Uh, I'll just try to get set up here. Perfect. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, so I was asked to um, do... Uh, 
a short talk uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll aim for, uh, on one of our recent uh, publications in the European Journal of uh, Human Genetics, uh, which is titled uh, Genetic Testing and Monogenic Early Onset Atrial Fibrillation. Uh, most of this uh, work was done uh, while I was a genetic resident and a metabolic fellow. And uh, this was uh, a project that was mentored by Zach Laxman and Anna Lehman. And so they're really uh, have been great mentors throughout this whole study for me. So uh, without further ado, I hope you guys like this talk and we'll move forward here. Let's see. Uh, so some of the clinical questions uh, that I think kind of inspired this study uh, and uh, maybe even things to think about uh, uh, as I go through this short talk uh, are some of the things uh, below. And so um, for, for the first question, should genetic testing be offered to patients with atrial fibrillation? And if you believe that uh, genetic testing should be, um, uh, in what clinical scenario would uh, genetic testing be offered and maybe what, what population uh, of patients would you offer that to? Um, if genetic testing is done, what uh, what genes would you screen for and test for uh, within uh, atrial fibrillation? Uh, and and even further, what what kind of diagnostic yield would you expect to to find uh, or even discuss with patients uh, for identifying a monogenic explanation for atrial fibrillation? And, and even more so, you, um, if you do identify a monogenic explanation, how would that alter the management uh, for those patients? And those are some of the things that uh, we won't be able to address fully in this talk, but things that uh, hopefully uh, the study has provided some more insight to, to carry forward. Uh, so as we all know, atrial fibrillation is incredibly common, but there still remains uh, a lot of uh, patients with unexplained atrial fibrillation, despite having no obvious or easily identifiable clinical risk factors. And so this has been a, a rich population to study for, for the patient, uh, for the people that are interested in, in looking into the genetic aspects of atrial fibrillation. And so over the years, probably the last 20, maybe 25 years, there's actually been excellent uh, genetic and genomic studies done for atrial fibrillation. And this has really expanded linkage analyses, genome-wide association studies, and even targeted sequencing for rare variants in candidate genes for atrial fibrillation. And so this is really an area uh, that we wanted to uh, push further and see if any of these candidate genes were clinically relevant, uh, since there were so many over time noted to be a candidate gene. Uh, and so in terms of our study goals, really we had two main aims. Um, one was to simply determine which high yield candidate genes are clinically relevant for atrial fibrillation. And two is what, what, what was the diagnostic, what would be the diagnostic yield for identifying a pathogenic or path, uh, likely pathogenic variant in, in one of these robust, uh, robust atrial fibrillation genes. And so <clears throat> from a clinical perspective, our study focused uh, on 200 patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, and uh, these were patients who were 60 years of age or less. Uh, these patients were recruited through uh, uh, an atrial fibrillation clinic at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, and, um, and also through the London Health Sciences Center uh, uh, in London, Ontario. All patients had uh, a diagnosis confirmed of atrial fibrillation, uh, but one of the benefits of this, uh, I think, cohort that was established was how well uh, these patients were phenotyped and, and to make sure that there was no um, risk factors that may have explained atrial fibrillation. And so that was one of the strengths, I think, of, of this cohort that has been established. And of course, everyone within this cohort ended up having genetic testing done through whole exome sequencing uh, from a research perspective at Genome Quebec. Um, from, a, from a genetic uh, perspective, there's really three main um, aspects that we needed to tackle. And so one was to find or select the candidate genes that we wanted to evaluate. Two was to evaluate uh, the selected genes using a ClinGen framework uh, for variant and gene level evidence. And three was really to apply ACMG criteria for variants that pass their threshold in these robust uh, uh, AFib genes. 
And so um, this, uh, for our gene selection process, we really considered a, a diverse and a broad uh, set of genes across the ion channels, structural proteins, and different signaling molecules. And so based on our prior sort of knowledge with some of these genes and the literature that was available, we decided to focus on 12 genes uh, that's highlighted here uh, to undergo further evaluation to see if they had enough evidence to, to really be considered disease associated. Um, for our gene evaluation process, uh, we considered <clears throat> all studies that had variant level data through cases or case control studies. Uh, we also considered all studies uh, at the gene level, uh, which primary or largely were scored through uh, the sort of the different functional assays and the different models that these assays were done in and the significance of the results. And so combining uh, the scores from these two sections, uh, we were able to score each gene that we evaluated into different categories, such as definite, strong, moderate, or limited. Uh, and of note, this was done by uh, two individuals Dependent bio curators and uh, any any of the disputes between classifications were addressed with the the other co-authors in mind. Um, in terms of uh, assessing the variants, after we were able to identify the genes that uh, had sufficient or robust evidence, uh, we <clears throat> uh, used the software. Uh, called Golden Helix to help um, build a filtering algorithm, as you can see in step two and step three. Step two was really just a QC filter that we used, uh, and step three was a variant sort of level filter that uh, we applied uh, to look for variants that we wanted to spend more time to actually manually view those under the ACMG criteria. Um, in terms of uh, our results for identifying uh, the relevant genes, we categorized uh, each of these 12 genes into three different categories as it relates to significance for disease causality. The, the first category uh, 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 in category A with definite or strong uh, amount of evidence, uh, which essentially just means that uh, we felt that there's three genes that had sufficient evidence to be clinically relevant uh, for atrial fibrillation. The second category, yellow here, or category B, uh, were genes with moderate uh, amount of evidence, uh, meaning these genes were, had some convincing evidence, but not enough at this point to support uh, uh, disease causality and probably just needs more evidence if these were to be pushed further. Uh, and then the third category in red or category C uh, were genes with limited amount of evidence, meaning genes with little evidence to support any disease causality at this point in time. A special note, uh, uh, PIDX2 in category B or in the moderate evidence uh, was initially classified uh, uh, into the definite or strong evidence category based on the, the available ev evidence and how the bio, both of the bio curators evaluate it. But after discussions with the other co-authors, we decided to downgrade it before other evidence became available uh, uh, for this sort of upgrading and back to the definite or strong evidence category. In terms of the results for identifying relevant variants, we identified six patients uh, with TTN variants uh, uh, listed here, and one patient with a frame shift variant in the KCNQ1 gene uh, that uh, all these variants, which all these variants were classified either as likely pathogenic or pathogenic, and were considered the underlying explanation for these patients underlying atrial fibrillation. Uh, in addition, uh, we were also able to gain a bit more insight uh, into um, uh, some of the genetic aspects with this cohort because the 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 London group was also uh, published a, a relatively recent study looking at loss of function uh, and uh, loss of function variants and copy number variants uh, with, within cardiomyopathy genes. And so they, based on their analysis, they were able to identify two large deletions in the TTN gene, which we would have missed just based on the, the sequence technology that uh, we used. Uh, but more interestingly, there's actually two TTN variants that they noticed uh, that we ended up filtering out uh, early on. So uh, a few other, uh, so just the 
to sort of take into account for the full explanation from a monogenic aspect. Um, in terms of uh, when when you identify uh, a monogenic culprit uh, for atrial fibrillation, you'll always probably have to ask yourself, like, how would this uh, alter uh, sort of the man management strategies? And so there's four different points uh, that we discuss and, and things to potentially think about. Uh, and so one is, is this uh, could this facilitate screening for other associated phenotypes such as inherited rhythms or cardiomyopathies with atrial fibrillation being a precursor? Uh, two, could this uh, help with selecting a more target antiarrhythmic agent to improve symptom control or reduce other off-target side effects? Uh, and for example, if you identify a, a variant in one of the ion channel uh, <clears throat> defects, uh, three, could this help guide um, toward choosing different ablation strategies with pulmonary vein isolation versus substrate modification for achieving better success rates? And, and lastly, uh, can, uh, can this help with choosing different screening modalities with, Im with, uh, with imaging for uh, if, if you were to identify a genetic defect in the structural uh, uh, channel gene or uh, in the structural protein gene? And so a, a few just take home messages from this study um, as it relates to even identifying genes that have sufficient evidence. We, so we, we essentially identified three main genes uh, that uh, clearly have sufficient clinical evidence for uh, being disease associated with atrial fibrillation and should be considered uh, uh, for screening or testing if, uh, if warranted in a clinical setting. Um, we also identified five other genes that sort of fit into this middle category of moderate evidence, uh, but uh, it still it requires a bit more uh, evidence before I think that can be uh, sort of incorporated to genetic testing uh, convincingly. Uh, and then in terms of the diagnostic yield, we identified about a 3% diagnostic yield for identifying a monogenic cause. But if we factor in the 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 results from the the London group as well, it, it sort of increases it to about 6% uh, within these genes with robust evidence. Uh, and so uh, that's another consideration. And lastly, uh, a lot of uh, the patients in our cohort uh, still remain unexplained. And so uh, only 5% or so had some sort of monogenic explanation. And so uh, considering other uh, aspects uh, and atrial fibrillation is obviously important, and and so uh, such as a polygenic risk score, and so that's that's certainly one aspect to also explore for this patient cohort. But uh, I, you know, the question is, does this account for the rest of the ninety five percent? And it's probably unlikely. So, considering maybe evaluating further. Uh, curing further evidence for atrial fibrillation genes and expanding from the list that we started with could be a, a good alternative. Uh, and also even characterizing or functionally characterizing some of the uh, variants of uncertain significance that were a bit more suspicious could maybe explain a bit more uh, and increase your diagnostic yield. Uh, and of course, there's probably genes out there that uh, we haven't explored or found yet that may also be contributing. So some of the things to, to consider uh, uh, as next steps and moving forward. And then lastly, I'll just quickly highlight, because I, I don't know how much time we have, but uh, I just wanted to highlight that um, uh, there's a nice review article coming out soon uh, in the Canadian of Cardiology, which uh, helps, I think, helps provide a bit more dedicated insight into the potential rule uh, for genetic testing in atrial fibrillation for the future. So something to keep an uh, eye out uh, for. So that's it, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, fantastic presentation. Congratulations again on the on the paper. Um, we're just going to let David just go through and just compile any questions. I saw one pop up from Andrew. I think I saw Jason Roberts as well, so he may have uh, some comments to make as well or questions. Um, so, yep, great presentation. Thank you. Obviously, we're, we're, you've been talking about the monogenic basis of atrial fibrillation, and there's a lot of work and a lot of thought now about polygenic risk scores, and you touched on that as well. I mean, were you surprised by the overall yield in regards to the monogenic cause, or was it in line with your thinking? And uh, what's the future for polygenic, do you think? 
Yeah, I, I think I think the knowledge right now is that atrial fibrillation is primarily made up or consists of poly, like an increased polygenic sort of risk. Uh, and I think um, it's well known that a monogenic explanation is certainly the minority uh, of, of cases. Um, but the question is, is that minority population, is there any relevance to screening and, and will that change actually management? And so it might be a small portion, but depending on how many patients that are sort of in that early onset atrial fibrillation category, those patients actually could be a, a decent sized number. Um, and so, yeah, not surprising. I think the, uh, we certainly, the three to 6% is a conservative rate. Other groups uh, have reported a little higher, um, but I think within that five to 10% is, is the current consensus for some sort of monogenic cul uh, culprit right now. Great. Yeah, perfect, perfect, thank you. So uh, uh, Andrew asked us uh, a question here in the chat um, about uh, PITEX2 and pulmonary venous embryology um, and uh, suggesting that, uh, that that gene was particularly uh, important in that stage of development. Do you think that that um, suggests that the uh, that pulmonary vein isolation might be particularly effective in this population? And uh, as a follow-up question, do you have any comments on uh, GWAS in this in this group? Good question. I don't have a great answer for that. I think that's a, a tough question <laughs> to answer right now. Uh, I think uh, we certainly went back and forth with it uh, and how relevant PEDX2 is. Uh, certainly there's the development of the pulmonary sleeves. I mean, certainly there's some thought that it could or plausible mechanism uh, that has been well known uh, for many years. But uh, yeah, it's it's tough because the evidence that we evaluated um, wasn't really variant at level evidence. And so there's not many families that A, have been screened and looked for. And so, you know, I think the, the evidence that we looked at was kind of skewed to just looking at the gene level evidence. So knockout moses and stuff like that. And so with the ClinGen sort of framework, they like to see a combination of those two sort of pieces of evidence. Uh, and so when one is more skewed to the other, uh, then it kind of raises um, a little bit more suspicion and concerns or sort of reservations towards the um, if this should be used in a, in a clinical setting or push to sort of uh, a definite or strong evidence gene to consider for genetic testing. So that's, um, that might not answer uh, Dr. Kron's sort of exact uh, question, but I think it's a tough question to answer right now, to be honest. And the follow-up question? Um, uh, was um, do you have any comments about uh, GWAS in this population? Yeah, I, I mean it's a little different from what our study was uh, and what our study was looking at, but yeah, sure. I mean the PEDX too. There's uh, a few common variants that have been well described, and I think that's uh, uh, certainly could be playing a role too. We didn't, um, our group didn't look at those common SNPs. And so I think it is, um, it would be nice to sort of look at all those at-risk SNPs and combine them and sort of see how much uh, uh, is sort of incorporated into a high polygenic risk score and how many sort of are explained by a monogenic explanation. And then you're so, you're go going to be kind of limited to, or you're going to have a proportion of patients that still don't have an answer. And I think it's that population that's also going to be interesting in and is it because it's still more polygenic and we just need to sort of find uh, more SNPs or is there actually, is this a bit more monogenic? Uh, so I think there's still a lot to be done, but when you isolate your cohorts and if you focus on the monogenic aspect, it's nice to also have the polygenic sort of scores all there. And I, I know that the London group did look into some of that as well. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, I mean, I think that's, um, a combination of both is, is helpful to know. So uh, uh, one question I have then um, would be, um, so were any of the variants that you found, were they also associated with cardiomyopathy? Um, I know there were, in the paper, there was a lot of discussion about the QT intervals of the various participants, which all seemed, to, well, mostly to be normal in those patients with um uh, long QT associated genes and and um, 
to what extent do you think that that the variants we've that you identified were were kind of uh, potentially markers of a risk of later going on to develop one of the inherited heart disease phenotypes that we that we uh, look after and uh, and if not is there something particular about these genetic variants particularly in in the titan variants in the location or the characteristics that make them more likely to present as atrial fibrillation than cardiomyopathy it's a great question i think that's uh i i don't think we know that yet to be honest uh, like obviously the patients that we had all had echoes uh i don't think and so nothing obvious from a, like a heart failure or uh, sort of from that perspective that was easily identified uh, I, I don't think a lot of them had cardiac MRIs or anything like that, um, but uh, certainly, um, yeah, I think you know, those TTN, I mean, that's, is there an underlying atrial myopathy that's going to evolve or develop, right? And so we know that most of these um, are sort of, um, that, that's certainly possible. So um, I don't think from a genotype, phenotype perspective that we can say, hey, you identify this variant in this TTN in this location, uh, this is going to predict whether you develop that. I, I don't think that gene type phenotype is well correlated just yet, um, but I think um, it obviously that would be uh, great if that could be done, right? So. I think uh, Zach has his hand up. Yeah, thanks. Great uh, presentation, Brandon. Very nice. I'll ask you for the slides later um, so I can reuse them. Sure. Um, I just wanted to address that last question, which is a good one. Uh, we have a paper in press uh, from a family from this cohort where the father had atrial fibrillation, but the daughter and actually a son had ventricular arrhythmias, and we generated some stem cell models. And the funny thing is, is the father's Atrial cardiomyocytes in a dish are diseased, but is ventricular or not? Um, and the opposite is true for the daughter. So they have the same gene uh, in the same location, but it's all the other genetic modifiers that we don't understand that are probably having some impact as well as lifestyle and other things on phenotype. So with that in mind, um, would it be uh, potentially relevant to, to do some family screening for for other forms of inherited heart disease in individuals presenting with uh, very early onset atrial fibrillation? Yeah, I'll let Brandon answer that. Uh, yeah, I think, I, I certainly think that would be a reasonable thing to do. Um, yeah. Um, seems like we have exhausted the audience questions. So uh, I'll, um, I'll move on to, uh, to introducing our next presentation.